Ladies and gentlemen, can I please have your attention? I've just been handed an urgent and horrifying news story. And I need all of you to stop what you're doing and listen. Hey everybody, this is the One Hour Photo Podcast by Studio C41. And uh, this is finally a break from the break itself and uh, I'm very excited to kick off this new series of interviews and um, and I I cannot think of any better way to uh, kick the series off with a very cool interview. Uh, It is with uh, Emmy nominated journalist Carlos Beltran. How are you doing, man? Doing well, man. Thank you for the invite. So it's really cool to start the series out because, you know, when this video dropped, I was just absolutely blown away because the the production quality just went through. It was just fantastic. And it was something where throughout the entire video, I was like, yes, yes, that's exactly, you know, like everything that we as film photographers that are discovering this for the first time have been like exclaiming and throwing our fist to the sky saying that this is exactly how we feel. And, and one of the things is that we've always felt like we've been a niche, like a corner in the film in the photography world. And it was awesome to see some, something as big as NBC to, to run this. And, and it was very exciting to see that. So, um, I, I, I'm going to shut up now <laughs> and I'd like to um, uh, hear a little bit about yourself and how you got into photography. And then and then the sh- uh, interview will essentially kind of lead into learning a little bit more about this video. So tell us about yourself, Carlos. Thanks, man. So, I mean, basically, if you want to go that far back, some 27 30 i'm gonna be 34 soon if you want to go back uh, three decades ago i since i can remember i've had a camera with me of course growing up in the late 80s you know 90s i had a point and shoot i think it might have been one of those snapshot cameras i can't even remember <laughs> the the actual one but i remember going to either summer camp or vacations with my rolls of film yeah to me it sounds crazy to think about those times where i actually had a little fanny pack with rolls of film in there and me being a you know 9 10 11 year old i would just put on the rolls of film and that's how we take pictures yeah. it's crazy to think how things have changed uh, i've been the black family of the black family the black sheep of my family i mm-hmm. um my family's filled with uh businessmen and uh mm-hmm. business women and uh doctors and engineers and from a very very early age i knew that i wanted to just i had this itch to create Mm. to put things out there i painted i took photographs i was in the conservatory you know for music theory so i've always had that itch to create right i'm lucky enough that today i can uh, make a living off of my you know very infantile urges uh, to make videos and images (laughs) and tell stories so that followed me through uh followed me through uh, high school making silly videos with my friends using Mm -hmm. very cheap you know tape recorders through college using very cheap uh point and shoots that happen to shoot like you know some five megapixel video uh up to you know journalism school where i learned how to use you know uh clunky you know tape cameras and to the day where most people think that everything changed in 2008 with uh, the Canon uh, 5D Mark II, you know, one of those cameras, DSLRs yeah. that came out and that changed the game. Uh, and that was my first professional camera, the one that I actually started uh-huh. producing professional content with. So in, in short, that's that's ba- basically it. I've always been taking photos like many of the people that you might, you know, ask, you know, that are currently uh, taking photographs. Yeah. Very cool. So um, for that time that you've been creating and everything, I'm really curious, how did that transition from, you know, photograph, uh, um, photographing and then that video and then leading up to like, was there a blend of like the love of film and then the videography that kind of like meshed together? I mean, what what was that? Um, Yeah. I mean, what kind of led up to like the the creation of this video? Uh, Well, I mean, 
<laughs> I could probably talk about years uh, of what <laughs> might have led up to uh, to my love for film and photography and video that finally led up to this 10 minute documentary that I made and that you're talking about. But uh, if you want to go as far back, I always knew that photography would be something that I would do out of enjoyment. I just love taking photographs of people, right? So street photography has always been a very big part of um, you know, uh, me as a creative process, but it had to be in uh, school, probably in 2005, 2006, you know, wasn't when I was in college that I figured that if I took video and then edited it in a witty, funny way, and then presented it over to friends and family, when I heard them laugh or react to them or comment on them, mm -hmm. that's when I knew, holy crap, I actually want to I want to do this, right? Yeah. And that's when I switched my major from uh, business. I was actually a business major for a little bit over to journalism. Uh, I went to school at the University of Kansas, so in, uh, near Kansas City. Uh -huh. And uh, I just thought, this is what I want to do. I want to shoot video. I want to edit it. I want to present stories to people for them to enjoy them. So that's when I made that divide. Uh, in 2005, 2006, I said, video work, I hope it's going to be my, my professional, my money-making yeah. scheme or whatnot. And then photography is going to be this thing that I'm going to do to enjoy myself uh, just for the pure pleasure of creating. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So. Very cool. So <laughs> I, I want to dive into the creation of this video. So um, you are in the heart of New York City and mm -hmm. um, and there are so many contemporary photographers um mm -hmm. that are coming out of there uh willem verb is one of them mm -hmm. joe greer is another big name um what is this thing that's going on right now with film photography and new york city because i've met with the folks over at lamography and it's it's like a, it's mm -hmm. like its own world within itself over there <laughs> so what what was it like like meeting with uh like Willem and everything like that? Have you have you even met um uh Joe Greer as well out of curiosity? No, 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 no I haven't. I think uh, New York has always been this romanticized city where people come together. It's a melting pot of talent, mm -hmm. ethnicities, backgrounds. Uh it's natural that in a city like this mm -hmm. uh, you'll find people also with very wide array of interests. Um I think this is why, you know, film photography is hitting it big over here, like in the rest of the world. But um uh, no, to answer your question, no, you know, um it was probably six, seven months ago. I'm talking about mid 2019. Mm -hmm. Um I just started watching a lot of YouTube content, but the YouTube content I was watching was of uh, Gary Winogrand, it was mm. uh, J Joel Merowitz, it was, uh, yeah. you know, Robert Frank, just the old masters talking about their books, their experiences, yeah. where they did not have this uh, uh, choice between digital and film, right? Uh, they just talked about the ethereal, you know, uh, values and aspects of taking photographs, right? Yeah. Um, and then at some point, I thought, you know, I dropped film photography back in 2014. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to get it back. I want to get back to, you know, grabbing my camera and slowing down and, and taking photos. Let the whole thing and the beauty of it, of it be the process mm -hmm. of taking the photograph more than the photograph itself. So, right. so in order to get into the groove of things again, I eventually ran into those names, you know, uh, Willem Verbeek, uh, mm -hmm. Uh, Nick Carver, uh, Matt Day, yep. uh, Joe Greer, who, you know, very recently started his YouTube channel, but he had the Instagram going on. Yeah. So I ran into them and for about four months, I watched everything they put out because I knew that at some point I would pitch this story to uh, NBC, you know, yeah. the network that I produced this piece for. But I, but I did it. That's the thing. I did it out of passion. I didn't do it as a for many of, of my other thousands of stories, I've done research, sure. you know, uh, you know, overnight on a flight or on a train somewhere. And I've just, you know, gotten the bullet points for the interview. This, I basically did a very casual three to four months of reach the research out of pure want and passion of seeing these guys talking yeah. about the beauty of film photography in 2019, 2020, you know? 
So that's eventually I pitched this story to my managing editor and I said, look, it's not about the niche. It's about uh, the fact that film photography has been, you know, resurging, like re- revitalized since 2014. Mm-hmm. Uh, so this is not like a breaking news, something new, but I haven't seen something done yeah. about the community and about this new wave of film photographers and film photography seriously yeah lots of blog posts lots of videos for a lot of independent uh, uh photographers out there like willem and all these guys but i haven't seen something put together seriously yeah uh and you know i was lucky enough that my managing editor uh said sure you know that's uh, awesome do it i'm sorry there's a an ambulance i guess or a cop car uh running by but new york <laughs> city baby <laughs> new york city absolutely <laughs> So that and that's cool. that's yeah. that, that's how the story ca- uh, came to be. Then it was a yeah. matter of I probably shot that story in you know one two three four five six days. Yeah, I mean I had probably a little longer than that. I shot it, but uh, a day with each important character or each character that I wanted to feature. Yeah. There's plenty of other people. I have to make this clear. I know you haven't asked this question. I want to make mm-hmm. it clear that. I would have loved to feature many more yeah. uh, people. There's a lot of people, and I get these messages all the time, like, oh, I wish, mm. uh, you know, the guy from uh, Grainy Days or, you know, uh, I, I yeah. wish the other guy, King Jives or whatever, would have yeah. been featured. Look, I've watched all those channels, yeah. and I enjoy them all. I just, I would have been impossible for me to fit, <laughs> let alone. Yeah. Talking about film photography in the digital age in just 10 minutes is near impossible. Yeah. I don't even think it, I did it justice. I'm just lucky that people are receiving it very well. Yeah. But to be able to include the entire community into it, it was uh, such a challenge. So yeah, so I talked to, because these three guys were, first of all, because Willem lives here in New York, Yeah. it was a no-brainer. It was like, yeah, no, I'll, I'll definitely follow him. I'll feature yeah. him over there. And then I wanted to get Matt's voice because he started his channel back in 2014. Yeah, he was in the earliest and ones. Absolutely. And then Nick Carver, uh, a guy that he actually came to New York and visited with me uh, Mm -hmm. a little bit. He's such a serious photographer. Not that anybody, no no one else is. No, he's a serious medium format photographer. I really love his style. So I thought I'm also going to talk to him, you know, but yeah, it's uh, it's just uh, the picking and choosing who's going to be in this piece, you know? Yeah, no, I totally understand. And I completely agree because, you know, I've been doing this podcast for almost three years and you we're not even running short of potential guests that we can reach out right. to. Right. You know, right. and, and I could totally understand and, and respect as far as like, well, these keeping it very focused and keeping the message on key is probably the most important thing um, right. of that video. So it, it was really cool to, to get, uh, those three and uh, Matt Day, I'm still trying to get a hold of you, man. So if you're watching this, man, <laughs> uh, not kidding side, but um you know, I think it's um, a very interesting uh, concept as far as the traveling. So you did a little bit of uh, traveling to Rochester uh, and you went to the Kodak Center and um, mm-hmm. uh, you got to do a tour of the finishing line, which I was there as well. So we actually share mm-hmm. a very common experience because it is just absolutely mind blowing. Incredible. Yeah, so, yeah, it, it literally is like the Willy Wonka factory of film. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, yeah. So when when you went, um, what were your expectations prior to like, you know, Kodak is this huge name, right? And and such an iconic mm-hmm. brand. And then um, when you went through the factory and you saw the production lines, um, what was like your before experience? Like, what was your expectation? And then what was your w- walk away from from that whole experience? Mm hmm. Yeah, I mean, I would have to let's just go back a little bit to be able to go to the factory as a journalist Mm -hmm. and uh, and film the whole process and meet with Ed Hurley, the general manager of film wasn't wasn't a thing that I could just set up in a in a day. Mm. Uh I am, believe it or not, not the first person who wants to go and film the you know the Kodak factory. So it actually took me about a week to email, even even from my NBC official account, email account, uh, reaching out to different people in different departments so yeah. that they knew that I was a serious journalist and this thing was happening. Right. 
eventually i believe someone might have uh you know seen the work that we had done seen my you know profiles on, sure. on online seen my website and they said okay this guy's for real um look i i had seen i had expectations precisely because of all the older videos that had been done at the kodak factory negative feedback uh yep. george uh, negative feedback they went there and I had seen that video before, so I thought that's a that's a feasible thing. They did an amazing video, uh, you know, George and his team uh, did it. So I thought, you know what, I, I want to get good B roll, but I also want to get the voice of Kodak. So my from the get go, my uh, my need was to get uh, the general manager Ed Hurley, who gave me an absolute impressive and very concise and wonderful interview. Uh, spent all day with me, uh, t- personally taking me to different departments. Even showed me the the actual uh, uh, motion picture uh, film center. I think there's one take of him stand standing in the middle of the motion picture crates, you know, on the yeah. on, on the piece uh, that I shot. So, uh, so that was it. I mean, I knew what to expect in terms yeah. of the visuals. But I had I had no idea how grand the factory because it's like a small city. Yeah, if you've been there, uh, you know that's a, it's a it's a small city. There's everything. They even had their own uh, uh, train station yep. over there because in the olden days they would manufacture the film. They'd be working twenty four seven. They would load up all those train cars. And they would go to the rest of America. Yep, insane to be able to actually see that. I wish that I could have included. Uh, uh, all those little B-roll shots that I took of the yeah. what, what I consider to be Kodak City, you know. Yeah, that's really cool, and 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 that is absolutely awesome that you came in with such a strong game plan as far as how you want to document it. Because uh, when we did the tour, I asked, you know, hey, can I bring a camera? Can I film this as well and everything? Mm-hmm. And and so they were like, yeah, sure. So I have mm-hmm. I've been sitting on it sadly for about two years of all this footage, mm-hmm. and the problem is, is I don't know how to put it together into a story. And and so as somebody mm-hmm. like you that knows um, how to create an idea and then tell a story and then put it in video, um, it, I was kind of thinking the opposite direction. I'm going to do this video mm-hmm. and then I'll tell the story. And then mm-hmm. I just have all these clips of, you know, going through the factory mm-hmm. and all that stuff. And I'm like, man, I don't know what I'm going to do with this. And and I want to <laughs> share it out to the world. And it, it, it's going to be a project where I'm going to have to kind of figure out how to how to put that together myself. So it, it's an amazing <laughs> experience. So that's really right. cool. All right. So um, Thanks, man. what is the message that you were hoping to get away from doing this video and uh, talking to um, Nick Carver, Willem Verb uh, and Matt Day, like, was there any kind of like wisdom that they shared with you as far as what they've done and that, how has that impacted you? You know, it's interesting when you come into, or you research a community from the outside Mm -hmm. i had heard these guys talking about the film community for months uh you know talking about the you know how loving the community is how close how you know tight the community is and uh it's not that i didn't believe that i believed it i just Mm -hmm. didn't know how true it was uh and i'll elaborate that on that later but uh the message i have colleagues journalists colleagues of mine who would ask me when they see me with a, with an old film camera, 35 millimeter, they would ask literally, they'd ask me, how do you get the film from your camera to your cell phone? <laughs> I mean, we're talking about professional <laughs> journalists who would ask, who would be baffled by going from film to your Instagram account. Right. So yeah. I figured, you know, there's this, romanticization like you know the the photography has been romanticized for the past you know three four years we have magnum photos uh dropping uh tutorials on photography they do have two big ones uh out there right now when they hadn't for years right yeah so this is the culture or the, the past two years have been the years of the master classes and people have been uh, very, especially online, and people have been very close to photography. Like there's some, not only film photography, photography as a whole. So I just thought, uh, I, I, I thought the message would be to show everybody 
the, everybody, not only the, the film community, but just everyone, uh, as far as NBC could reach, that uh, there is a new wave of uh, film photographers and film, film enthusiasts out there. Mm. And I wanted to do my best to explain the process. Yeah. This combination between the you know film properties and film process and then the digital attributes that the process as a whole can have, right? You pre-produce, you shoot on film, and then you edit and share digitally. This is something that had never happened before that has yeah. been happening for the past four years because, you know, softwares are getting better and then Instagram is a thing. Yeah. So that was my main thing, just to let let people talk about the new wave. Did I know that it was going to be so well received? No, I had no idea. To be quite honest, mm. the, the video has been doing quite well. It's been published now for six, seven days and it's now on blogs. People from all over the world are sharing it. You know, yeah. uh, I actually, <laughs> I was baffled because I had a sheer, uh, you know, uh, narcissistic impulses. I just searched on Twitter for the name of the, of the, of the film of the short doc, just to try to see who, who, who was saying what and who, you know, and, uh, I saw many people from all over the world, China, Japan, yeah. uh, you know, Brazil, South America, the U S can just talking about this film. So it means that there's a community out there who's appreciating this very much. So, yeah. yeah. That's that's absolutely awesome. And and it's really cool because um, I, I with this podcast, we do have access to like analytics uh, ourselves. Mm -hmm. And so I'm able to kind of see where uh, it, this podcast is being listened to. And it literally mm -hmm. is touching every single continent with the exception of Antarctica. But, you know, that I don't think there's going to be <laughs> much a of a tough. listener base. Yeah. yeah, it's tough to break through that market. Um, but, yeah. uh, you know, it's really interesting to see that. And it's just like, you know, uh, I just started seeing some that were popping up in the Middle East. Like I saw some that were popping up from Israel and everything along those lines. I was like, that, whoa, that's, cool, that's way like what? Like, I, I cannot fathom like what? What is it that I'm saying that it gets people to start listening over there, right? You people know? are just yeah. very hungry, man. People yeah. are hungry to hear about about this. Some someone commented, people are falling in love with film again, or falling in love with with film for the first time because of digital fatigue. Yeah, we're all so tired of everything being up in the cloud and our screens and everything being so immediate. Yeah, that the fact that you get to craft something or think about something for a little longer. It is, you know, and you're talking about demographics and audiences. That's why I wanted to. And I was lucky enough that Willem, for the record, Willem did say in front of the camera that he hates and he hadn't looked at, you know, his demographics and stuff. He never really does that. He's yeah. a very, very, uh, you know, casual guy. He doesn't do it for the money or the followers or anything. It That's just cool. happens organically. So on camera, I might post that clip at some point. He says, oh, by the <laughs> way, I'm just doing this because Carlos is making me laugh. So uh, but he, he did look at the demographics, you know, and he and I actually, that's what I wanted to see. He looked at who's watching his videos. He's over 130,000 followers yeah. now. He had 1,000 follow, 100,000 followers when we filmed the video. So like it, the rate of growth of his channel is huge. And he saw that it was from 25 to 30, yep. 18 to 24, 25 to 34, the largest crowd. We're talking young people yep. watching his content. That's, uh, you know, and it's not only because only young people watch YouTube or millennials and Gen Zers watch YouTube. It's who's watching his content. Right. You know, that's, that's important. So, yeah, that was a big part. I needed to get that on camera to make the point that younger generations are going back or uh, rediscovering, I mean, uh, film. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's, uh, it was really funny because when I saw that portion of the video, I was like, that looks just like mine. Like, I mean, like almost identical mm -hmm. bell curve as far as, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the the spread of the demographic. So it's, it, it, it's true. I mean, you know, I, I have no problem. I can show mine and show the spread as well. So it's really sure. cool to see that. Um, now, there was one component that I know of that video that a lot of people were, I want to say, kind of turned off by was mm -hmm. the. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I can't remember who it was, but he said that mm -hmm. um, film may not last mm -hmm. long because of the mm -hmm. environmental concerns that are mm -hmm. associated and waste along those lines. And, and I think mm -hmm. that was probably one of the most I don't want to say negative, but, you know, 
critical mm-hmm. responses mm-hmm. to that. Um, mm-hmm. As a journalist that went into that, mm-hmm. I know like mm-hmm. me, if I heard that, I'd be like, no, you're wrong, you know, but, you know, mm-hmm. um, it was interesting to hear that contrast because I don't know whether that's a tough mm-hmm. pill to swallow or if it was something mm-hmm. that is just kind of like maybe I just kind of, you know, agree to disagree. Um, what right. was what was the kind of, you know, was that like a response that you were expecting when when that interview happened? Right. Uh no, I wasn't expecting that uh, that answer. It just happened mm. organically. That was the, the opinion. Here's the thing. As a journalist, there are certain type of stories that you go into wanting to fact check everything that the person in front of you is saying. Yeah. Usually they're politicians, so you're working in a very tough, breaking newsy, timely, important story. Right. None of this wasn't important, but this was a story more on the lighter side of things. And many of the things that every single subject says is based on opinion, very subjective. Sure. So it's hard for me to tell Willem, for example, who was talking about the love of film by younger generations, well, not all younger people like film, right. or you know, there's older people out there who are saying that uh, you know, the younger generation is just you know, a bunch of brass and hipsters sure. rediscover- like, acting like they're discovering film. I couldn't have that opinion. I wanted to get everybody's opinion. And yeah. up until that point, towards the end, we had heard about this love and resurgence for film. In order for me to finish off uh, the documentary, I wanted to get some sort of more conflicting idea. And that's honestly the last minute of the piece, minute and a half, when we hear, that's that's what sets up the stakes, right? Mm -hmm. Is film really going to go away or not, right? And that so that last portion starts with him saying, for his reasons, film might actually go away because of environmental reasons. And then comes Matt Day saying, I believe film is always going to be a niche because, you know, not everybody has the patience. Then comes Nick Carver saying, uh, the community is working to keep film alive. And then comes Ed Hurley from the Kodak, Eastman Kodak saying the future looks bright. So what I wanted to do with those four people and those that last beat was to go from the most, you can call it pessimistic of views when it comes to film. Sure. And then end on literally a bright note when Ed yeah. Hurley is saying the future look, looks bright. So I wanted to give that curve uh, just to add a little bit spice over there and then to be able to <laughs> add an opinion yeah. that might be contrary to many others. But look, we can honestly talk about how the film features mostly uh, white men. Sure. Uh, right. Aside from from me, mm-hmm. you know, I'm, uh, I'm Latino and I'm an immigrant mm-hmm. uh, over here in the U.S., uh, the only person of color. The rest of the film, look, I wanted to add so many more people. We actually interviewed someone from the International Center of Photography, a wonderful lady uh, uh, from the International Center. We just didn't have the room uh, to add her because it would have been an entirely different topic. It would have been it would have mm. been five, six more minutes of content sure. that we couldn't add. So we had to make sacrifices to keep everyone over there. So if there was if there was a second or third part to this, I would definitely then not try to add a more diversity for the sake of adding diversity, but there is a plethora of very talented film photographers out there. And I want to make it clear that the reason why I picked and why we picked uh, Willem, Nick, and uh, Matt mm-hmm. uh, to be the the main uh, members of the community or the voice of the community is because Willem is very young, uh, twenty years old, which makes a point to why we're doing this piece in the first place. And he also is uh, recruiting a huge following. Matt is someone who started talking only about film photography in 2014, and also he has a huge following. And Nick Carver has a pretty good following. He's like a, he has a cult following. Yeah. And uh, he's very, very methodical about it. So I thought those three were, would absolutely work for what we're doing. Yes. Are, are there other amazing uh, female film photographers over there? 100%. Absolutely. Sure. Abs- 100%. And I would have loved uh, to include them in the second and third part. I absolutely will. Yeah. But in terms of numbers and reach, Matt, Nick, and Willem were the ones who would serve more of the purpose that we uh, we were sending out to to execute you know what i mean yeah no no totally and and i think um one of the things that we've been trying to do is certainly reach out and and have a wider diversity in in the interviews that we have as well 
And um, and I mean, those can be, like you said earlier, topics within themselves within the film uh, community. So it's really cool that, you know, it's really tough to, to make those sacrifices to get at least mm-hmm. a to make sure that the, the message isn't lost throughout the video. Um, mm-hmm. And and um, and you have a constraints with those windows. And one of the funny things that um, a friend of mine who is really big into uh, editing uh, video, he's like, sometimes you just got to punch that puppy and and then you got (laughs) to suck it up. And, you know, I was like, ah, man, that's, you know, and so he was helping me out with like a first cut of my editing. And and so I was like, no, that that bit is important. He goes, are you sure it's that important? I'm like, ah, so it's yeah, that's very tough. That's really tough. That's the most difficult part of uh, telling stories is yeah. not only about time constraints, but it's also about what's going to keep the story flowing, right. right? That you can have, you could certainly, like what we're doing over here, we're just talking for what could be an hour and then hopefully people will listen attentively. But yeah. when you're doing video, uh, it, it is not this casual. Video, you know, has its beats, has a middle, uh, like beginning, middle, and end. end. Right. Uh, it needs to be very effective and, and accurate. So, so you have again not only time constraints, but you have to make the points, and you have to make them non redundantly. Right? right. You cannot be redundant with a point. You make it and you move on. You have no idea how many. You know, hopefully, this BC to 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 say in your mm-hmm. podcast. Yeah. You know how many babies I killed on yeah. this in this story? Right. Right. It's uh, I had to just drop sound bites and drop interviewees and drop moments that I thought would be not only funny, but important Yeah, because I had to keep focus on what the thesis of the story was. Right. You know? So, yeah. Yeah. That's really tough. And then I, I commend you for it. Cause, and I think you did deliver a very effective message because yeah. I mean, I watched it all the way through and that's the lat that's the toughest part. And I, you know, I see it through my, my stuff is that last quarter, you know, that last mm-hmm. 25% of the video that you're putting out there drops off. Right. You know, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. so uh, keeping that engagement, I saw that and I, I was always straight through the end and I was like, wow, that was that was pretty awesome. Um, mm-hmm. So, so Thanks, that man. so that was one hell of a tangent that I made. I, I did want to bring it back really <laughs> quick um, with the, the critical component where the person kind of um said well it's not going to be here forever and that there's uh environmental concerns yeah well we may be quick to jump to say we disagree with that mm-hmm. i think that there is some legitimacy with what that comment was said because um it's essentially the changes of uh regulation effectively killed mm-hmm. kodachrome Right. So the EPA laws changed and said this particular die coupler in this uh, uh, particular film is not environmentally safe. And unfortunately, Kodak said that's it. They had to kill it as a result of all Mm -hmm. that. So um, so I think that there is legitimacy that, um, you know, it could very well be something that could happen tomorrow and then say, you know, we can't it's illegal to make it, you know? So it's very Mm -hmm. real thing. I don't think that the person was certainly wrong by any stretch, but you know, it's, it's quick to jump to say, no, you're wrong. But, uh, I totally understand. I I think that most people's argument has been, look, your digital phone because of the plastic and circuits and everything that goes into making it is if not more as, uh, you know, uh, devastating to the, you know, to the you know the, to nature as right. uh you know uh film is uh so i mean it, again it, it's it's perspectives right. their opinions and the catachrome did go away there's a reason why ectochrome came back and right. it's because film processes are safer chemicals are safer um but uh, i did not dog in dig, dig in or dwell on the whole well let's just fact check what's more uh destructive to the you know to, to nature uh you know yeah. uh, a cell phone or a film you know camera right yeah so, but again it was it was an opinion I right think. yeah well that's really cool so um one of the things i guess from that video that um i felt like after i watched it i was like i gotta immediately share this out and i think um it certainly resonated with a lot of people and i think that's why it's getting passed around 
consistently. Um, would you feel like that? Um, not so much that the, your message has been heard because it certainly has been heard. Um, do you feel like that it was effective? You know, so yeah, you got all these views and watches and retweets and all that stuff. Um, was it the end result that you were expecting? Right. So it's interesting that you say that because as a journalist, I don't have a message. Mm. As a journalist, I had a story. And as a journalist, I'm just sharing this story. I'm sharing mm. the voice, not of my own, but of the community of film lovers, film enthusiasts, film producers, uh, you know, camera retailers. That is the message that I'm putting out there. What that particular community that I happen to belong to is putting out there. Mm -hmm. I've done stories about um, euthanasia. I've done stories about cocaine trafficking. Sure. You know, so it's not a message that I'm putting that my own message or my own agenda that I'm putting out there, just mm. a message that I'm putting out Look, some of the, the stories or voices that I've wanted to put out there, they get like 9,000 views or 20,000 views, right? Like not a whole lot of people, uh, you know, relatively connect with them. But all of my stories are character driven mm. because I try to give a particular person and a particular topic a voice. So yeah, the, that's the long answer to your question. I wasn't yeah. trying to put out a a personal message. I'm not a YouTube content creator. I'm a journalist. So mm. hopefully it's resonating with people because the voice that I put on that video is connecting with everybody else. Wow. Uh, right. Uh, has it been effective? Um, and you can measure effectiveness in so many different ways. Has it been, has it gotten a whole bunch of views relatively, uh, you know, has gotten quite a, quite a bit of views, but that's not really what, I'm personally sure, looking right. for the network might be looking for that. Sure. Not necessarily, but the comments that I get, mm -hmm. the direct messages, the Instagram messages, the Twitter messages of people saying, I grabbed the camera after many years because I was able to see how much people actually love this. Or a 16 year old, you know, uh, uh, guy saying, you know, my family, my mother is actually asking me what's wrong with me because I'm spending money on film and, you know, and, and I showed her this video so that she would shut up, you know, so that's, that is just, that is just so much fun. How, you yeah. know, a different, you know, of course, and I've gotten the messages saying, well, look, you might've missed this point. You might've sure. missed that one. Uh, you know, it always happens. It's yeah. not going to be perfect, but the fact is that I, I am, personally as a journalist getting messages from people saying that they appreciate the story the community is appreciating the story in that sense i believe the story was uh, effective yeah that that is actually probably an awesome yeah that is an awesome answer as far as the effectiveness that people were reaching out i mean i reached out to you you know yeah, and, I, and and that that was you know it really did was uh you know, resonate with me. And, and, and as I said earlier, you know, throw my hands in the air going, yes, this is it. This is what, you know, I've been trying to say and, and to see that, you know, it's, you know, being shared on, on such a large network, it, it was just a fantastic feeling and it wasn't even my piece, man. <laughs> so, well, thanks for, for sharing it and watching it. Yeah. yeah appreciate it. No, absolutely. Um, so I, I caught, you said something that you said that there was going to be a second and third part. Can you kind of uh, expand on that? Yeah, I'm hoping. No, it's nothing official. I'm, sure. I'm hoping that, uh, look, look, certainly it wouldn't be with uh, the network. Mm -hmm. uh, I got to put this out there. It wouldn't be with uh, NBC. NBC allowed me to produce this, um, let's just call it piece and not first part for the sake of being proper. Fair enough. Um, I believe there's an. I believe that there's so much to say about this new wave uh, of film enthusiasts. Mm -hmm. um, I would love Carlos Beltran would personally love to work on a second, third, or even you know fourth part on uh, you know film photography in the digital age. Um, if there's something that if that's something that can be put together and collaborate independently with uh, the community. That's amazing. That's something yeah. that I would love to do. Uh, I believe the success of this particular piece, and I'm being very candid and frank with you over here. I believe that the sure. success uh, or perceived success of this piece that you're mentioning right now, why uh, 
why we still love film. That's the official name of it. I believe that its success doesn't depend on the fact that it was released by NBC. Mm-hmm. I believe its success is the fact that it painted a picture that people related with it. And then the community put it out there and yeah. shared it. So the success of a independent second, third or fourth part would depend entirely on the, on the community coming together and making it happen. Uh, that's what I believe. Yeah. That's awesome. So what, what's, uh, what is after this? So the, the piece is done. And so we mm-hmm. did talk that there might be a two and a three. Um, mm-hmm. Do you see like, are there going to be other projects now that are going to be totally unrelated to, to film photography? Like, mm-hmm. is this the one piece and now you're just like on to the next one? Or uh, do you think you'll, you'll really revisit uh, this or maybe other areas within film photography? Look, I, um, and that's a that's a good question, but mm-hmm. I gotta go say again as a as a video journalist, I every single piece that I've done has been different for the past. Yeah. And when I say two and a half, three years, is because that's how long I've been with NBC, the network that allowed me to make this piece, right? But for the past ten years, I've worked professionally on stories, pieces, whether they're two minute long to fourteen, fifteen, twenty, an hour long documentaries and all of them are a little different yeah. right i'm not appealing to a niche in my kind of work so i'm not mm-hmm. only doing things for the immigrant community the latino community mm-hmm. or the you know the film community not at all I, I i change the you know the 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 scope and the subject of my pieces that's a long answer short yeah. answer um Film photography has always been a thing of mine. If you yeah. look at my Instagram page, it's filled lately for the past six months. It's been filled solely with film photography. I shoot on 35 millimeter and I tried a bunch of films and I shoot with my uh, Hasselblad uh, 120. Uh, and I enjoy that. And that's what I put on there. And I do have a, if everything goes as planned, knocking on wood, a book project that I started oh, cool. uh, 10 years ago on mm-hmm. film is going to come out this year. Oh, wow. So, but that's a passionate passion. That's a passion project. It's the personal project. Uh, I'm doing it be- out of love and because I've met the right people who have helped me put that project together. Right. Mm-hmm. So when it comes to my personal involvement with film, I will forever continue <laughs> as far as film exists. <laughs> and as far as my cameras work, continue shooting film, putting out for whomever cares about my photographs, putting out, putting them out there. Mm. These uh, couple of books that I'm putting together on uh, shot on film will be out there. But, um, but when it comes to uh, video production, uh, I'm finishing up a documentary that's taken me three years to make that wow. has nothing to do with film. It's on the NBA uh, you know, if anybody's into sports, I'm doing a documentary about the NBA. So, um, short answer to your question. I don't have anything planned in yeah. terms of video, a documentary that follows through film photography. Mm-hmm. My personal work does mm-hmm. my passion projects are all directly related to film and the film photography community. Very cool. Now, would you say that, uh, it, this particular piece, it was easier than the other pieces that say um that are more so like assignments where you have to do a research and and mm-hmm. and prep and kind of understand was it did it seem more natural and like you you're like i know this you jumped straight into it or i mean i know there um, there was research associated with this but was there something different from this piece versus something that, that is not something that you would say that you're passionate about yeah, that's actually a good question. It might be counterintuitive, uh, precisely because I had so much information, precisely because I was so biased and passionate mm, about it. Yeah, uh, made it tough to say. Yeah, I'm gonna fill. I get you saying only ten minutes with everything I know, everything I want to know, and everyone I want to include into this. In that sense. I mean, I spent uh, probably the better part of three weeks 
uh, editing this piece. I mean, it's only 10 minutes. You see pieces that come out once a week from any YouTuber or YouTube creator out, out there that's like 14, 15, 20 minutes long. Nick Carver has like 20, 33, 45 minute long pieces that he, that he puts together. It took me three, probably two, three weeks to put together this piece very concisely because of there's pressure. Mm -hmm. I wanted to be very accurate. I wanted to be as fair as I could be. And I, I know I didn't reach the, the level of fairness that some people would have liked, but, sure. but I try my best to just be able to just fit everything. In that sense, it was quite difficult. There are mm -hmm. other stories where are very fact based, right? You're only going to include those things that check out. You're only going to include those things that drive the story forward. It's not about the passion of it. It's about the information. Um, and in that sense, it's, it's very tough. That said, many of my stories, if you go to my site, uh, many of the stories that I've done are very um, human interest stories, very character driven. Mm -hmm. So a huge chunk of those stories are about the experience, the human experience. So it's about someone, uh, m you know, mourning. It's about someone uh, hurting or it's about mm -hmm. someone's victory or it's about right. it's. It's about that. And in that sense, plenty of things are very subjective. So, yeah. Very cool. No, that, yeah, it does seem counterintuitive, but as you start to explain it, yeah, it, it's tough to separate yourself from something that you're very mm -hmm. passionate about. And, and how do you tell a story or a, uh, um, uh, a piece objectively um mm -hmm. that that is tough that is, i can see how that can be much harder in contrast to to other pieces so that's really cool right 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 so uh carlos um i think that wraps it up man um Good. it was a an absolute blast speaking to you um how oh, do thanks, we man. how do we find your work uh your other documentaries um and um how do we find you on your social media thanks man i first of all i appreciate the work that you do and many other you know amazing podcasters and talented photographers are uh, there do i mean the fact that you're sharing uh voices out there that might have otherwise been you know kind of hidden i appreciate that yeah. uh Look, my handles uh, are all the same. Uh, Carlos P, as in Paul Beltran. So Carlos P. Beltran uh, on Twitter, on Instagram. And my website is carlospbeltran.com. I'm always available. I have uh, for people that want to go into video making. Uh, a few years ago, I made a series of tutorials literally explaining how do you get into video production, video journalism, video storytelling. And those are all on my site for free. Wow. I've always been so close to that part of the freelance community. Um, I'm very thankful for the fact that I've gotten the opportunity to make a living out of this. So, um, yeah, yeah, everybody, uh, you know, can check out the, not only the work, but those pieces of advice on my site. Yeah. Fantastic. And I'm I'm probably going to right after this interview, head over and check out those pieces, because that's certainly something Good. that I'm I need to learn quite a bit on. So I'm very much looking forward Good, to that. Man. Good. If you're ever in New York, uh, give me a shout. I'll give you a, a special tour around. Where are you based out of, though? Yeah, Do I know where you I'm uh, out of Atlanta, but uh, I got Atlanta. I got family in New York. So definitely uh, uh, New York City yeah. is uh, in in my future. So. So, uh, Carlos, I got one last question for you. Um, and, and I typically end these interviews with um, with this question. Uh, what question did I not ask that you would have liked me to have asked on this interview? <laughs> <laughs> I love that uh, question. I guess for the sake of this uh, conversation, a very simple one, it would have been, uh, what's my favorite film? Oh. Uh, <laughs> what is your favorite film then? Uh, my favorite old time film is Portra 800. Uh, I know there's a lot, yeah. of, a lot of hype for Portra. A lot of people are just, ah, uh, screw Portra. But <laughs> to me, the flex... The flexibility of a 800 uh, ISO film and portrait how it renders colors. I mean, that's my serious or quote unquote serious work. I shoot on portrait 100 because I know that film quite well. Yeah. Um, but 
look, there's it's all about subjective stuff. Any other film probably do great. So yeah. <laughs> Very cool. Well, I, I would say that I am 100 percent on board with you on that response because Portrait 800 is certainly one of my favorites as well. So all right, sounds good, man. Very cool. All right, guys. Well, uh, that wraps it up for this episode. Uh, Carlos, thank you again, man. It was an absolute blast. I learned a lot. Listeners, I hope you learned a lot from this. Um, so uh, I typically close this episode by saying, "Shoot some film, dang it." Um, would you be able to help me close with that? Oh, my gosh. Do it. Be passionate about it. And uh, like I stated on my, my piece, you know, slow down and take every moment a frame at a time. So, yeah. Sounds great. All right, guys. Well, that's it. And shoot some film. Dang it. <laughs>